From a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux. How fast do armies move? Hey guys, this is just a really quick post to address a question I've seen lurking around thinking about my previous post on the logistics of the loot train battle. No pictures today, just some quick text on the topic. A lot of readers were throwing up question marks on how I was figuring marching speeds. I realized that I was taking for granted what would be understood in my field, the standard rule of thumb marching speeds. A lot of readers question two things. First, that Cersei reports riding from somewhere, King's Landing, to Winterfell in a month, being disconcordant with the long march time from High Garden to King's Landing. And second, that 12 miles a day was much too slow. Both of these get into how do we calculate how fast an army can move. Let's start with infantry on the march. Infantry on the march. The intuitive, and a touch clever, method is to take normal human walking speed, around 3 miles per hour, multiply it by walking hours per day, maybe 8, and go with that. This makes intuitive sense, but, but if large army logistics made intuitive sense, they wouldn't be hard. And as Clausewitz says, drink, quote, War is very simple, but the simplest thing is very hard, end quote. Logistics is very hard. So why don't armies move at roughly 25 miles per day? So let's think about, in very general terms, what needs to happen and in what order for a large body of infantry to march. Everyone wakes up and starts to get moving, probably around 5 a.m. Breakfast needs to happen, which may require making fires. Tents need to be struck and stowed along with all of the gear in the baggage train, and individual soldiers need to stow their own equipment. All sorts of small tasks add up to eat away parts of the morning. Then, everyone needs to get gathered and ready to march. And now, because you are a large body of infantry, you wait. Let me explain. Let's take a nominally full strength, roughly 3,000 men, American Civil War Brigade marching on a road 13 feet or so wide. You can get five men, a little cramped, into a single row on that road, meaning that the infantry itself stretches 600 ranks deep. Unlike in the movies, which love ultra-compact marching formations because it looks cool, you need a few feet of separation between rows for best effect. World War II U.S. Army guidelines specified two to five yards Let's assume each soldier occupies about five feet in the marching order. So, the infantry is 3,000 feet long, 914 meters, nine football fields. You also need unit separation between the regiments. It's important to avoid accordioning on the march and facilitate control. World War II Army regs suggested 100 yards between companies, 50 yards between platoons. So these could be quite large. So... Let's round up to 4,000 feet, 1,219 meters, 13 football fields. But we also have tents, food supplies, spare ammunition, and all sorts of other of what the Romans would have called impedimenta. Side note, if you are thinking, well, but a pre-gunpowder army doesn't need this. One, arrows take up space, and two, camp entrenching supplies. The Romans marched heavy. How many wagons, pack animals, or porters you need varies. The Romans seem to have often moved with a mule for every six to eight men, plus the army siege train. A good rule of thumb I've seen for American Civil War estimates is around 20 wagons per thousand. So, 60 wagons. Rule of thumb in the ACW is 80 wagons to a mile of road. So our wagon train ought to take up around another 4,000 feet. Side note. You can see why logistics gets complicated fast. Even in explaining a rule of thumb, I have to resort to rules of thumb, or else we have to inventory all of the stuff an infantry brigade needs, and all of the food they need, and then parcel it out by wagons, and then figure for the mule or horse teams for the wagons, and on and on. Fortunately for the historians, this sort of work was done by the armies at the time and written down, so we tend to use their staff work. So the entire force is probably a bit more than 8,000 feet long, one and a half miles. 
In practice, there's actually a lot more space eaten up in separation between wagons, between men, so it would be longer, but I don't want to get lost in the details. And this is just for 3,000 infantry. We have no cavalry with their many spare horses, three per man as a typical minimum. Or, God forbid, a siege train, which might involve hundreds of wagons. Here's the thing. The last man in the line cannot start marching until that entire formation has marched past him. The more men you are sending down the same road, the worse the problem gets. For our single brigade, the wait is probably close to an hour. For an army of, say, 10,000 men, you're now talking about the last man waiting in the camp while some five miles of army marches past him. That's about two to three hours of waiting. Moreover, the front of the army has to stop where the last man will stop for the night since the army camps together, because to do otherwise is dangerous. And remember, that last man may have started marching hours after the first man, putting him miles back down the road. So another two or three hours where now the front of the army isn't moving even though the back is. And worse yet, the entire army is limited to the speed of its slowest element, either waiting for it to move forward in the morning or waiting for it to catch up in the evening. Well, getting started ate quite a few hours, but at least we're going to move at a constant speed all day, right? Of course not. These are humans. They need to eat, lunch, drink, and relieve themselves. Men will fall out of line because they are sick, or because they sprained an ankle, or because they're tired of marching and faking it. Many army guidelines put the medics at the back of the marching column for this purpose. To add to this, wagons get stuck in the mud, mules and horses get stubborn or lame. That chance may seem low, but remember we're dealing with thousands of animals. Small percentages add up fast when you have a few thousand of something. For reference on how much time this can eat up, 1950s U.S. Army Marching Regulations, this is again FM 21-18, foot marches, suggests that, quote, Battle groups or smaller, end quote, 800 men or less generally, so small, fast-moving infantry, can, quote, under favorable conditions, end quote, read good, modern, paved roads in good weather, make 15 to 20 miles in a continuous eight-hour march, a forced march, marching longer than eight hours and at a higher than normal pace, can cover more ground, roughly 35 miles in a day in some cases, but such a pace will wear out an infantry force fast. At the end of the day, the army needs to arrive at its planned campsite long enough to make camp. Cooking needs to be done, food that was foraged by flanking units needs to get to the camp, be recorded and stored, or processed and eaten. Speaking of which, note that we haven't even discussed flankers, scouts, and foraging parties. Wages need to be paid, paperwork needs to be done, in many armies, the camp will need to be fortified. The Romans built a wood palisade fortified camp every night on the march. And then everyone goes to sleep around 9 p.m. And that, to be clear, is when everything works like clockwork, which it never does. For a large army, the breaking camp, waiting to begin marching, waiting for the last man to arrive, dealing with pack animals and wagons, slices a few hours off of that eight-hour march routine. All of which is why a normal, large body of infantry moves something closer to 8 to 12 miles per day than the 24, 8 hours times 3.1 miles per hour per day implied by Wikipedia's average human walking speed. Historians doing studies of campaigns thus tend to use these sorts of rule-of-thumb speeds without much feeling the need to explain why armies move so slow. Because I think they expect that most of their readers are either fellow historians or former soldiers, and in either case, already know. These rules of thumb, in turn, derive from staff planning in the age when armies still mostly walked to war, especially the 1800s and early 1900s. Those staff office planners would have, and presumably still do have, elaborate tables of how many men can move how fast, over what sort of roads, in what kind of weather. 
because bad staff work multiplied over massive armies can mean catastrophic logistics and timing failures. See Frontiers, Battle of Thee, 1914, for examples. If anything, for a medieval army of conscripts, fresh from a successful battle with a long supply train moving off of the main roads 12 miles per day is actually quite fast. Large armies with lots of wagons often strayed into single-digit marching speeds. And to be clear, marching speeds are highly variable based on terrain and the rest. For Jamie, straying off the Rose Road, terrain would be deeply unfavorable for his wagons, slowing him down further. Getting to Winterfell on horseback. Okay, and what about Robert's royal progression, making it to Winterfell in, quote, about a month, end quote. According to the standard reckonings, Winterfell is 1,600 miles from King's Landing. This is based on using the official maps and creating a scale from the known length, 100 leagues equals 300 miles, of the wall. But we actually don't have any dialogue suggesting that the royal party went directly from King's Landing to Winterfell. It's possible the ride was shorter. Side note, these kinds of travel distances are part of why the sort of kingdom Robert has, where rule requires personal relationships like this, doesn't get this big historically. Robert's party may be large by our standards, a few hundred individuals, all mounted. But by army standards, it's a tiny force. And small groups of cavalry, if they ride hard and bring spare horses, and they do, can move very fast. As I've noted before, the Mongols manage strategic movements over long periods up to 60 miles per day. But then, they are the Mongols. And the books note specifically that the pace was unlikely to be too rushed since Robert had brought his entire family. There are a lot of things we could do to make this work. If we had Robert ride quite hard, he can make it in maybe 35 or 40 days, which we might say is about a month. We might also have Robert start from somewhere further north, perhaps Dari or the Airy or even the Twins, since the sort of personal kingship that Martin seems to have envisaged, but not always planned for, historically required very frequent travel. But... I think all of that is overcomplicating the obvious, which is that, taking much of the world building of Westeros together, it is clear that while Martin is great at many things, managing scale in his world is not one of them. I realize that one of the claims that A Song of Ice and Fire fans like to make for their series is that it is more grounded and more real than other medieval fantasy. Martin occasionally makes this claim too. But speaking as a specialist in pre-modern armies and economies, particularly Roman ones, it isn't. In practice, then, I think the most likely thing is the storyteller messed up and misjudged the time it would take to cover the distance. A word. If anything, Tolkien's first-person experience of war and his deep grounding in medieval and Anglo-Saxon literature means that, while Tolkien does not stop to discuss Aragorn's tax policy. Middle-earth tends to fit within the zone of the possible much more neatly than Westeros. Armies in Middle-earth move at normal speeds, the economic and population systems, and the human terrain with them make sense, characters behave within the confines of religious belief and social custom, and so on. Martin is a fantastic storyteller, but I think his claims to a realer medieval fantasy are hollow. But then, he's telling such a good story, should he ever finish it, that I don't think he needs to make that claim. As for the show, Benioff and Weiss are even worse at managing distance and time and understand how the various parts of a pre-modern society work even less, which means they tend to take Martin's minor miscalculations, a two-month trip becoming a one-month trip, and magnify them. Armies instantly teleport over continental distances. Maybe somewhere down the line, when I have a bit more time, we can get a bit more into the weeds on how fast armies move and the complications of logistics that entails. For those who don't want to wait, instead want some book recommendations, some good places to start for thinking about these problems are Jay Landers, The Field and the Forge, Population, Production, and Power in the Pre-Industrial West, 2005. J.P. Roth, 
The Logistics of the Roman Army at War, 1998. P. Erdkamp, Hunger and the Sword, Warfare and Food Supply in Roman Republican Wars, 1998. D. W. Ingalls, Alexander the Great and the Logistics of the Macedonian Army, 1980. G. Parker, The Army of Flanders and the Spanish Road, 2004, Second Edition. I especially recommend Landers, which offers a truly excellent overview of nearly all of the sticky, messy problems of creating, mobilizing, moving, and paying armies in the pre-modern world. He stretches from Rome to the early modern in an effort to show the very real continuities in warfare. Unfortunately, the book is pretty expensive, as is normally the case with these sorts of studies, so maybe check your local library for a copy. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, A Great Divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.